on with that lively fanfare, you know it's time for another lovely edition, a wonderful edition of uh, one of our favorite shows, What's Great Pop with Danielle. Yes. Hello, hello, Ian. Thank you very much. And hello to all our listeners on Shades Radio. And a very special hello to the Netherlands this evening. Because this evening it's about punk, it's about women, it's about the Netherlands, it's about women, punk bands in the Netherlands, but not just. Um, because listening to my guests talk to uh, a few days ago, I came to realize that, in a way, this show also has another purpose. And that purpose is that we have to take care of our musical heritage. Uh, because if we don't, we lose it. And um, as much as we thought we were doing, um, what, we, what we were doing in another century was crucial at the time. We're all mortals and memories fade. And, you know, material support, many posters, concert tickets disintegrate, and we die. So, um, even though, you know, you could say that Punk's mantra may have been die young, stay pretty well, there should be at least someone who remembers who said that. Um, and to explore this today, we have three guest speakers. Two of them are musicians, and one of them is an anthropologist, no less. And each of them has prepared a playlist for our collective Sonic Delight. And I know Herman has organized a listening party on the Punk Studies page. So thank you for this, Herman. So we have a really international audience today. Hello, folks. Uh, Thanks for joining yeah, us. Hello. We could have learned how to say hello in, um, in Dutch, but we didn't. <laughs> Salut. Salut. Uh, but um, I think they will introduce themselves. So a major thank you to Pebbles, Aurelia, and Herman for being so generous with, uh, with your time. And we can go ahead. I think just to say uh, the, the, um, the, the, you know, the plan of the program, we'll have th th three guests speaking one after the other. So I think we have Pebbles first, and then her playlist, Herman, his playlist, and then Aurelia and her playlists, and we'll, we'll reconvene at the end for a short chat. Cool. All right. Looking forward to this one. Um, love all of the ones that you do with the interviews, and uh, this subject is uh, one I know um, not enough about, so... We're ready. What number are we on, uh, episode-wise? 33. All right. 33. Yeah. All right. Yeah, already, yeah. Here we go. Here's our first interview for yeah. today with Pebbles on Blitz Creek Pop. Yeah. Shades Radio. Radio. You are listening to Blitz Creek Pop on Shades Radio. This is our 33rd edition, and today we have an ex ex exclusive interview with three guests um, who have kindly said yes to our invitation to come and talk about women punk bands in the Netherlands in the late 70s to the early 80s, and possibly their legacy. Hopefully, we can talk about that too. Um, it's a topic I would say that most of our listeners don't know much about, and, you know, here at Let's Quick Bob, we want, we want to uh, hear everything about it. And, you know, in a few minutes, I let my guests introduce themselves briefly. Um, and then we'll take it into in, in different sections. Um, so we've decided to uh, share our interview between Pebbles' account of her days as a member of Motorboat and City Squad. Then we will focus on what Herman's research topic is, which is to say, give us an overview of the place of women in punk music in the Netherlands. And finally, uh, we have an anthropologist with us, Aurelia, um, who will talk to us uh, perhaps about the place of women uh, in, you know, the place of women punk band in the in subculture and maybe in the women's movement in general. So first, you know, maybe Pebbles, would you like to introduce yourself and then we'll hear Herman and Aurelia. 
Sure. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'll just go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Who are you? Thanks, Pebbles. Because sorry. Who are you, Pebbles? Because I yeah. am okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm Pebbles uh, Willekes. I'm from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, I was just 15, maybe. I was maybe just 14 still when uh, punk rock uh, washed over Europe and, uh, you know, immediately felt attracted to the, to the kind of the rawness and the anarchy and the protests and, you know, that whole thing that makes punk rock amazing and um, started playing in bands. And that's Great. why I'm on the radio today with you. So, yes. So you're a musician and Herman, who yeah. are you? Herman, you're a musician as well. But you're well, also a researcher now. Well, yes, and, uh, and I started the first uh, punk fanzine in the Netherlands, which was not from Amsterdam at the time, yes. And I interviewed uh, Pebbles uh, then uh, for it and others, yeah. Right. 1978, yes. Yeah. And yeah. how are you? Who are you? Um, yeah, I'm anthropologist and I'm originally come from Lithuania, but I lived in the Netherlands already for 20 years. And uh, I, just like Herman, have been um, a fans and editor back in Lithuania in the 90s, so a bit different generation than yeah, other yes. guests. And uh, yeah, I... Uh, was involved in um, some projects uh, related to preserving their subculture history and uh, fanzines in Lithuania. And through that, uh, I met as well Herman uh, because they had the conference about women in punk. And through that link, uh, I got into this project as well to interview uh, the women in um, who have been in the punk scene uh, for now we're, we're focusing for the first uh, the first wave but hopefully we can extend that to, to the other as well generations that's great thank you very much for introducing yourself and yourselves and then i think we want to start with uh, with pebbles because i think logically you know it makes sense to start with the musician and please if you have anything you know any more questions the other for the other two guests you know if you want to interrupt me or ask other questions to pebbles or each other please just you know no problem at all so uh for myself um i'd like to ask you pebbles it's pebbles is not your real name is it no, it's not. <laughs> uh, no, sometimes you know when people ask if, if that's my name, I, I sometimes try to make the joke that it's a very old traditional Dutch name. But um, no, it's, it's it's a nickname, and it actually is a nickname that I got because of punk rock. Uh, you know, back in the day, I I wanted to bleach my hair as white as Billy Idol had it back then. Yes, and something horrible happened, and my hair turned bright orange because you know. Yes, we just kids playing around with hair dye, and because I was wearing these leopard and and tiger print shirts with with safety pins, um, a kid in my class in in school said, "You know, if you put a bone in your hair, you look like pebbles." Yes, from the face. And he started calling me pebbles, and it just kind of spread. And you know, I tried to change it back to my name, but that didn't really work. And then I realized people remembered my name because it so different and now it's it's just my name now yes okay so maybe uh maybe you can talk to us maybe a little bit about how you got involved in the punk movement how you became a musician a punk musician yeah so uh, I, I had already been playing some guitar um uh, you know my mom we, we used to go on, on vacation to spain as a lot of dutch people do so we were in spain in a hotel and there was like a tombola or a bingo my mom won an acoustic guitar because she really wanted me to play guitar and i wanted to play guitar so i had like a couple of chords of knowledge and uh, i was like you know plunking away i was into hard rock uh as an early teen and um and then one day i said and i think it was top our, our top of the pops top up uh iggy pop came on and it kind of it, <laughs> something happened to me yes because <laughs> i was watching this madman completely destroying the sets because it was all lip syncing 
And he was not playing by the rule, you know, he was not standing there and like pretending to sing. He just started throwing, they had like fake palm trees and he started climbing them and they, and I was like, immediately, I was like, what is this? You know, this <laughs> oh, is something. It's yeah. a bit like the people, the generation before us, when they heard Elvis, it sounds a bit like, you know, people who said, I heard Elvis, I saw Elvis, and, you know, it changed my life. So you saw It definitely it. did, yeah. <laughs> and it changed your life. So, uh, it did. yeah, and so you started playing bass. Is that how you... you no, no, I'm a, I'm a bass player now. But um, so back then I was playing some guitar and, uh, you know, saw Iggy Pop. Then within a week, it felt like kids in my school were wearing like safety pins and porn G, like they, were, they looked like punks. So I kind of followed them around a little bit. And then uh, they told me about concerts in Paradiso uh, and, and I started, you know, going there. And then, um, then I, I, you know, I really, I wanted to play too. So and, you were um, in the scene, you were part of the scene basically, and then you wanted to get involved more. Yeah, I wanted to play and, and, um, I was, I, there was a little note. So there was a punk rock, uh, uh, a record store. It was called No Fun. And it's where we all got together, you know, where like every Saturday it was packed with kids and we would talk about music and, they always had the latest import records from, from the U, especially the UK. I, that's what I remember. And they had like a community board where you could leave messages. And, um, yes. and there was one, uh, Ronald, Ronald van der Brink, um, put a little note and, uh, looking for a guitar player. And I, I was like, I'm just, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call that number, you know, so before cell phones. So, I, I, yeah, when I it was in, I, it's really interesting this thing about no fun because in Paris we had, you know, maybe you know about the Parisian shop New Rose that mm. became a record label. And I had, you know, when I was reading your, your, your interview, I was thinking, wow, we've had the same experience. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's very much like we used to hang around. That was our social. The Thursday came and it was the day when the records were coming out. And, you know uh <laughs> the imports and then yeah so it was the third it was the thursdays i think in the netherlands too that's when yes. the when the pluggers would go to the radio stations and the new yeah it was exciting yeah. it was really exciting to see what what was coming our way because yes and was, yeah, yeah we, we had Rémi pepin on the show who was a member of guernica um, and some of those members became Berrurier a little bit later on, Berrurier Noir. So anyway, so we were, you know, and I think that's a topic that interests Herman, recollection and remembrance. But it's yeah. something I think uh, old punks uh, really remember is the, you know, the waiting for, 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 for the records. But uh, and also, I believe you worked in that shop as well. Yeah, I worked in that shop. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes. So, so I, yeah, in brackets because you know I was like I said I was very young and I was I was you know I was a school dropout. Um, I I like I I just didn't want to be in school. I wanted to be independent. I wanted to work, but because of my age, I could only you know I still had to go to school. I and I don't remember exactly two or three days I had to go to school, and the rest I could find a job. Um, and then one of my teachers kind of allowed me, he would give me like a little note that I couldn't make it. So I, I worked in no fun, but I just, you know, I was just smoking cigarettes and hanging out and I was selling records, but yes. it was like just being there, you know, and yeah, I were, and then, uh, you know, I, my dad took us, myself and my brother to the U S for a trip and I, I forgot to tell them. Oh, <laughs> so I kind of disappeared, and then when I came back, of course, I didn't have a job anymore. Yeah. And, you know, so is that how is that how you integrated your band? You you answered the uh, an advert yeah. from the community. Yeah, I called him. I remember calling him. I remember being really really nervous, and uh, my mom was like very supportive. She's like, just call, just call. I'm like, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't have an electric guitar. I just have this acoustic guitar. And, so I called and he, uh, we could really connect it. And um, I don't even know, I think my mom or a friend of my mom's, all of a sudden there was a, a cheap electric guitar and I didn't have money for a case. So it was in a garbage bag. I would take this guitar everywhere oh. in a garbage bag with, 
little bit of, you know, <laughs> style. <laughs> Through style, yeah. and, uh, and that was motorboat, and uh, it was it was I. Rona was quite a bit older than 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 myself, and uh, he had uh, you know he had a lot of ideas. He had a lot of knowledge of about rock and roll and about music. And uh, before we knew it, we had gigs because you know Paradiso would have special evenings in the in their small uh, hall upstairs, the small room for uh, local bands and it was almost like not like a real showcase but there would be like two or three local or or like dutch punk rock bands playing and sharing the stage in an right. evening and it was easy to get a, a gig that way so was it a band where you were the only woman in that band who you know who were in, you were the only woman in that band i was yeah i right. was and then what happened after motorboat how long does did it last and did you feel, you know, the topic of this chat is, you know, women, and did you feel you were being marginalized in the band, or did you feel you were an equal to the other members, or, you know, what was I, the... I felt, I felt pretty equal. Um, I, I think the only, the only uh, if, if you're talking about things not being level, it, it, it might have been because I was so much, like, younger than the others, uh, less experienced that... I was uh, like I was learning a lot and very quickly, but I felt like I felt like I was just one of the band members, especially in Motorboat. Everyone was very kind, and uh, I, there was a lot of room for me to develop myself as a musician. You know, because you you only need three chords in punk, or basically you need two, and then just go up the neck <laughs> to get you. You know, but there was a lot of learning, and uh, and then um, I, Ronald was the singer, but he was he was you know, giving me songs to sing on. Um, and then he he decided he wanted to go and do more like Dutch. He was one of the first people that I knew that was doing like Dutch rock and roll and Dutch uh, punk rock. And he left and we went on. There was a motorboat too, actually, uh, that not a lot of people know about. And it was mainly myself. Well, I was the only vocalist at that point. And we changed more to like, like a buscocks kind of like power pop punk and uh we were pretty good actually but we that fell apart right and then i joined, then i joined city squad so that was a band that existed as well city squad i mean to go back on motorboard i was reading yeah. your previous interview and I, one of the things that made me smile was i'm just going to quote you there is uh uh you were marred by a series of fuck-ups which I believe was the norm for many very poor punk bands for the motorboat period. What kind of, you know, what kind of uh, accidents or fuck-ups do you think happened? Was it something, you know, it's interesting that because I think it seemed to be part of the of the life of the time. I'm, I'm not sure uh, you're translating it from my Dutch, so I'm not oh, sure yes. what you're referring to. Uh, yes. Uh, but, but in general, uh, you know, it wasn't like, like, because of the time this was all happening, like there was no social media, there was no easy way to get a hold of people or, or exchange information. So we had a, we had an, uh, our rehearsal space was like, you had to take a bus out of Amsterdam. And it was in this like, weird small building somewhere in the middle of like, like where the cows were grazing. And if you missed the bus, you were stuck like in the middle of nowhere. So I remember being sitting in the bus with my guitar in my plastic bag, in my garbage bag going there. And, um, you know, that was interesting. Um, we like, another thing that happened is we, they, they booked us in Paradiso in the, in the, like in the, in the main hall as an opening act for a band that was like totally like New Orleans kind of jazzy, funky stuff. <laughs> and the audience were like mainly it was like the hippie time was still kind of happening and and then these these four snotty kids come on stage and we're like what do we buy and we start playing and they got upset and that band got upset with us and then paradiso we 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 got upset and we brought in the wrong people into this place and then we were not allowed to play paradiso anymore it's like it got a little bit messy there for a while yeah, yeah for sure yeah. So what happened to you then in City Squad? Do you think uh, it was a little bit less, you know, messy or, you know? Uh, um, 
Well, we really, well, we actually recorded a, a demo, like a, a, a demo with our songs, which I don't, I, th I think there's recordings of Motorboat Life, but they're like really like they're on cassette and really bad quality. But uh, with City Squad, it, it felt serious. We had a few people in the band who also were very serious about making music. Uh, but after a while, uh, I was replaced because I didn't have money to buy uh, uh, like a small PA. And they were like, well, you're singing, so that's your, you need to make sure you, you're hurt. And uh, yes. then they found someone else who actually had the money to buy the equipment. So I was replaced because of equipment issues. Yeah. So uh, I think we'll we'll listen to the to some City Squad songs. I think Herman picked some of the City Squad songs. Yeah, from that demo. Yeah, from that demo. Um, but anyway, now I was going to ask you the other thing is, do you feel you were uh, part of a movement that had a lot of you know that had a lot of girls in it, women in it, but also. Do you feel you were part of a movement that you were making history? Because although the punk movement was re relatively small in terms of time, I don't know about if the Netherlands, you know, I don't really think what's happening now in the punk movement equates to anything that uh, echoes anything uh, but the hope and uh, the hope for change and the energy mm -hmm. that uh, was expanded at that stage. So at, at the at the time, do you feel you were part of um, a movement that was, would make uh, musical history, a kind of either a closing chapter mm -hmm. of rock and roll, and what you know, what contribution do you think the you know you as a as a woman uh, was making in that in in that move in that moment, right? You know, I I think at, at the moment where th when things were happening, I did not realize um, that anything I was doing could have could influence or make a mark. Um, I did know back then that there were other like young women, girls who saw me play and went like, "I want to play." There was even a I taught one of uh, one of my friends. Um, who she and she became a bass player, and she's like, Can't "Teach me how to play the bass." And I'm like, "I play guitar." And she's like, "Well, let's. We'll just use the four strings, and you teach me how to play the four strings." And she became a bass player, and and yeah. she was like a year younger than I was, and she never thought about picking that bass guitar up until she saw me, and and was like, "I want to be in a band too," you know. And so I knew that, but. You hear stories later on, like, you know, when I run into people and we haven't seen each other since like 1979 or 1980, they're like, you know, you were, you were like so strong and you were such an influence. And I was like, I had no idea. I was just like, you know, I just wanted to express myself through music and, and, and feel, and it, you know, it was, there was some, through punk rock, I, I became aware of like feminism and, and yes. there was a political awakening in, in myself because I could see what the with the older kids were talking about. I would listen to them, and it opened my eye to a lot of things for sure. Yeah, uh, that, that was about you know I was going to move into that direction. But before we do this, it's it's interesting because the bass playing is probably not an instrument that is associated to women in music. I think um, it wasn't before. Wasn't before, yes, but it became. I think maybe. Would you agree that maybe during the punk era, this is when uh, women became bass players? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also because you know, there's there, there's this. I'm a bass player now, but there's this joke. Well, oh, you know, we'll give the bass to the, the guy in the band that doesn't really know how to play, who doesn't have a lot. You know, that was the joke before that the bass player was always kind of the yes, yes, person in the back, not important. <laughs> so I think maybe that's why you know bands bands were like oh yeah we'll we'll have the, she can play the bass you know give her the bass but then Tina Weymouth and Gay Gay Atford and uh, like a bunch of women were bass players and they were amazing and and you know so influential and um, yeah I think that changed and I think you're I think that's when it kind of started yeah. Um, for popular uh, music, anyways, because there's Carol, yeah. what's the name, Carol Kay? 
She's yes, a, but I mean, she was a professional, you know, she was... A yeah, we can, yeah, but she was there before yeah, anyone else yeah. was there, yeah. I, uh, um, and I think you were just about to move into the political, you know, this was, punk was always, and I think maybe Herman will talk to us a little bit more about the mm -hmm. political side with the uh, Rock Against Racism um, era, but um, I think it was political awakening for a lot of us. And maybe you'd like to um, talk about you know, how punk was a way, because, you know, and it, maybe it's something we talked to about Aurelia a little bit later on, because I think there's a big bit of a contradiction in terms uh, with rock and women, because, you know, many times in, in, um, in uh, films and documentaries, what you see is a huge amount of, um, girls, you know, groupies, you know, yelling and saying, oh, the men, you know, the men band, you know, are, are wonderful and so on. But at the same time, I think rock and roll was very liberating for a lot of women as well, maybe the earlier days. And then maybe at the punk stage, would it be fair for you to say that there was a kind of a fracture that happened where women our generation started noticing that, um, maybe there was an issue a gender issue that kind of stuff oh that's a that's a really big question <laughs> um but maybe I, aurelia might might help us with that yeah like uh, personally like you know i i felt like one of the guys most of the time yes. like I, I felt very equal and uh, but also you know sometimes some shitty things happen and you know some guys are still not very nice and some you know uh, less fortunate things happened in the back of a van one time and you know and i was like well i guess i'm still the girl and this guy thinks he can just do that because i'm the girl in the band you know but uh yeah overall i don't know um, i think that's a question that is it's such a big question i can't just yeah. give you a quick answer to it and uh, yeah, it's a big question. And the reason why I'm asking this question is because I certainly think my daughter, who would be in her late teens now, is somebody who's way more aware of gender issues than I ever was. Although, uh, although I was brought up in in a time past you too probably where, uh, you know, you were schooled to think that we were there was equality. And we're what forty years later or something like this, and then all the younger girls are coming up and saying, "No, no, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right." Mm -hmm. And I think, in a way, punk music with bands like X-Ray Specs um, and Su Susie were really us. Uh, the slits, maybe you know, if I may, you know, and this is why where I want to go there is mm -hmm. who were your you know role models in the in the um, as as women in the in the in the punk movement, it's Susie was the first, uh, yeah, the first one where I went like, oh my god, like I I like she wow, <laughs> you know, because she she exuded such a strength and independence, and she was all like her voice was amazing, but she, I wanted to be like her, like I was like she was like a role model to me. Um, uh, this, I loved the slits because they were so against and so different from from anyone else that I've I've ever heard. Um, Holly Styrene, she she was amazing, and and they were all. I think I think they I got it. I was attracted to their their bands and their music because they were so independent and so didn't care what other people would think. At least that's I don't. I don't don't know them personally, of course, but yes. that, is, that is the vibe I got, the energy that they exuded and that, what I was attracted to, you know? Yeah. And so for you, I mean, these bands were, you know, foreign bands in a way, uh, but th were there other bands in, in the Netherlands uh, who had female members and who you would have been friends with? Not really. There were, you know, let me think, the bugs, there was the bugs in Amsterdam. So we, there was a later when we rehearsed with City Squad, we were rehearsing in a squad um, in Amsterdam. It was called Huise Chaos, which translates to the home of chaos. And uh, it was like a four-story older Dutch building, Amsterdam building. And 
there was a rehearsal space downstairs where people would share their amps and you know there's not a lot of money of course so we would share and meet each other um so the bugs were rehearsing there there was um who was in the bugs simon who i taught how to play bass was in the bugs uh and then there was a band called infection and they had genie on the bass again and so we we would just hang out together um but they were not my role models because we kind of all came up at the same time um so we were you know we just they were we were like music buddies but we never played together at the same time we were all in our own little bands yeah and i mean i was i was thinking you know what would be your most positive memories of that period what you know when you think back on this period what's what you know uh, do you think about the shitty stuff that happened although i can see it you you can you can you're looking at it with a you know with a with a bit of humor but i'm sure at the time it wasn't really funny <laughs> well you know it wasn't fun, you know it wasn't so you know being 15 going on 16 years old i was uh, i was also uh, the, you know coming out as a as a queer person so i was a lots of self discovery and lots of like oh my god what's happening next uh, yes uh, my mom kicked me out of the house <laughs> i had to look for housing and uh, I, you know there was a lot happening in that time but um just looking back now i feel I feel very positive about that time. I feel it, that it, it it helped shape who I am um, because it made me it helped me be very independent and always look for different ways to look at something. It 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 like I said, there was a political awakening. Uh, it was the start of me being uh, oh, sorry. aware aware of <laughs> aware of what's going on in in not not like the world the world but like in, in Europe with like like neo fascism and 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 feeling that you know you have to do something to be a good citizen and you know I love I love the art anarchy as well like don't just believe what the government tells you like just think for yourself and so I feel I feel I have good that's the good memories I have and also I wouldn't be a musician now if it wasn't for punk rock yes that, that's it's really how i started yeah i'm i'm a little i'm you know i'd be interested to know a little bit more about the political stuff because i think we're going to i think sorry i was just checking playlists there so i think uh, herman in your playlist you're going to play walks from uh city squad and that's obviously a political uh a very political song do you feel mm -hmm. you were just that was the uh, motivation behind the writing of you know the composition of your of your music mostly uh well there's there's uh, for that song very much because it was you know the national front was like coming up and there was lots of like yeah, the neo-fascists and there was lots even in well not i can't say even in amsterdam because amsterdam is just like any big city there's you know all kinds of people but in Amsterdam there were certainly a few fascists uh, that were kind of trying to integrate into the punk rock scene and uh, there were actually like physical fights sometimes between the two groups and uh, they were really racist and, um, and and it hurt it was just painful to watch that and that's why I wrote that song right okay and you're the person who is right you're the author of the songs as well yeah, most of them. Yeah, yes. so so you're not just the bass player. You're you're the lyricist. No, I was the, in in that in those bands. I was the guitar player and singer, and oh, I wrote the songs and singer. Okay, yeah, right. bass came much later. So well, that's that's interesting. So how did you find the writing process? Like, you know, was it something that you know uh, came to you one day? I'm going I'm going to write lyrics, or. Uh, I, yeah, no, I, that's something I had, a, a, even when I was 12, 13, I had a little book and I would write in it and it, they were more like, because I was so into rock and roll, you know, hard rock before. So I was like, and I wanted, I, I always knew I wanted to do something with music, you know, and um, so I think it kind of developed. And now when I listen back to the lyrics, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, so that's clearly... <laughs> Like a fifteen-year-old writing in English well, as, as yes. a second language, you know. Yes. And, um, 
even the way I pronounce stuff, of course, but it's, you know, we, it was heartfelt what I did. Yeah. It, there was meaning behind it, for sure. Um, I think before we, we go on to Herman, maybe you'd like to say a few words about your play, the playlist that you have selected. Um, yeah, so... so um, of your eyes, I, I, have, I have it here, yeah. You have it here, yes. Yeah, so, so Susie, of course, is in there twice because... Susie and the Benjis. Yeah. Uh, Love and Avoid is a song that I've always really loved. I mean, the energy. And it's also a song. There was a benefit for the bass player in City Squad. He got stabbed um, and and by a police officer off duty who... Uh. Oh, no, no, stabbed. He was shot. Sorry. Who had his gun on him. And they got in an altercation in a snack bar after midnight. And the guy pulled the gun, shot him. There was so there was a benefit concert for Fred and I I sang Love and Avoid uh, and so it's a special feeling. Um, Penetration, oh my God, Life's a Gamble is such a I don't know such an amazing song. Uh, I'm a poser, X-ray specs. I don't know if I have to <laughs> explain. Yeah. Uh, then typical girls by the slits is it's got that weird jazzy backwards feeling to it and I, 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 I'm attracted to music that is not like just a you know regular uh, rhythms uh, the adverts is in there because a gay advert bass player and she yes. she was groundbreaking I think uh, the bush tatras are on there too many creeps just listen to the lyrics it's like too many creeps in the street um, Susie and the band she's again car cast Carcass? Is that how we say it? Yeah. Carcass. Yeah. Carcass. And then there's a one, The Pretenders, which is, uh, you know, some people say it's not punk rock, but that song, Precious, is so incredibly punk rock. And it's actually about Chrissy Hine moving from the US to the UK, mm. which I didn't know for the longest time. But I started listening. Um, and then Poison Girls, you know, anarchy, like, very very political so i wanted to add that one as well yeah i mean per personally um i know when i heard crass the first time i thought this is divine i loved crass uh, yeah. <laughs> i thought it was very melodic at the time but yeah to go back on chrissy hein it would be interesting to exchange notes with her because she probably has a very similar experience to yours um i would say you know you know in integrating a male band, but also uh, a foreign kind of uh, environment. Yeah. yeah. And didn't she didn't she live in Fr in France for a long time? I think she was a yeah, journalist. Yes. yes, Herman. She lived in France in the same uh, building as uh, Saskia de Jong, who became the drummer of the Loose. Yes, oh, and there were all these connections. Yeah. And uh, recently, Chrissy Hind visited Leiden and met uh, Saskia again, yes. Wow, that's amazing. I just yeah. love these connections between all yeah, this. And, uh, and yeah. that also meant uh, Chrissy Hind for a time when uh, she moved between uh, Paris and uh, London and Saskia did as well. And then Chrissy Hind was a shop girl in the shop of uh, Vivian Westwood and Malcolm uh, McLaren. And, Boy. Uh, yes, and she almost became the singer of The Clash and almost became the guitarist of The Damned. Yes. Almost. <laughs> and she was in Johnny Moped band, but was kicked out twice. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah. This is why we need Herman, because he knows everything. Yeah, no, so no now everything. I think we're, we'll be listening to your playlist and then we'll come back to uh, uh, to talk to Herman. Come back to, uh, uh, to talk to Herman. So, uh, Herman, uh, your trajectory uh, into the, the punk universe is quite unique, I think, because you said yourself, in the book, uh, in your entry, uh, you say, um, uh, your entry about Susie and the Banshees, uh, your, the record you picked in the punk listen book is Join Hands. And you say, the lose was your original inspiration for getting into punk, because at that stage you were writing for a fanzine called Pin. I would say not many people, uh, 
would say they got into punk because they listened to a, a female band. Well, I, I read uh, there was a review in 1977 of the second Mont de Marsan punk festival in France and the Loos were the only band there which played on both days and they had uh, three French girls and one Dutch girl who originally was from Leiden, from my uh, city. And I, I read the review in a Dutch uh, rock uh, music paper and uh, it was a very negative review and they said about the loose, uh, the, these are slum girls and slum girls don't belong on, on a, on a stage. And it made me really live it when, when I read uh, that. And I thought, well, I should really get to know more about, uh, punk. It can, can never be as bad as uh, the, this paper says. And then I decided I should form a band, which I had never thought about before and I started to the pin fencing I had never thought of uh, starting a music paper before and it both uh, happened uh, the fencing a bit uh, earlier than the the band uh, yeah at, at first uh, I had a band called, called uh, the, the Vipers they played only one gig and then uh, the girl who played bass, uh, uh, Gaia Vogt, moved to Amsterdam and, uh, and, uh, so the, the band was finished then, but then I met, uh, Terry and Terry was really the founder of the first all women punk band in the Netherlands called PVC. She, uh, she was one of the first punks in the Netherlands already in 90. 76, uh, she heard about uh, the Sex Pistols. She lived in Tilburg City and she might want to start a band, but, but uh, the problem was uh, she was the only punk in the Tilburg, so she could not start a band then. She had to wait till she was in Delft. Uh, well, and uh, then uh, after PVC, she started another band and then uh, I met her, her and we started the Cheap and Nasty. Um, right, yes. Um, and I think before we, we come to talk about your project, um, just a few words maybe about, I know you organized the launch of the book Punks Listen. Uh, mm. And I leave all, by the way, all the, all your, all the references and so on will be left onto the description of the program. So for listening, uh, listeners who are interested in, you know, getting the references we're talking about, this will be posted on the link with the show. Uh, but maybe you talked uh, before you talk about your, your project about interviewing, um, uh, members of uh, women punk bands. Just maybe a few words about how the launch of the Punks Listen went in Amsterdam. Who did you have talking or how did it go? There were total four people and there, there was a, a chair, uh, Anita Ragunot was, was the uh, chair and, uh, and the four people were the talking. Uh, uh, Emma Paulison, who was the youngest member of the, I think maybe the youngest author maybe of, of in the book, uh, who, who is a bass player and singer in a punk, uh, in a band called Daddy. And, and uh, then there was uh, Marcel Stoll, who uh, uh, is from a band which uh, started already decades ago in the Netherlands. Uh, band called Neurot, and then it was Andries van den Broek, uh, who, uh, who, who plays in a kind of folk punk band uh, inspired by Irish music uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, yes. And, uh, and there, uh, and Ira was the, there, and the, the three others uh, uh, also played then in the hockey venue in Amsterdam, uh, where it was, and uh, I, uh, was in the panel, but uh, our band could not play. We have a problem where our drummer is uh, uh, works uh, in healthcare and has to do overtime all the time, so rehearsals are cancelled, etc. Yeah, right. So, 
So, so, and there, Anita asks questions about why did you choose uh, that book? And uh, Emma chose uh, Never Mind uh, the Bollocks by, by uh, the Sex Pistols, and Marcel chose the uh, Sampra album, the Roxy uh, in London with various bands uh, on it. And, uh, and uh, then, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Andries van den Broek chose uh, an Irish uh, band, yes, uh, and I chose uh, the Join Hands by Susie and the Banshees. Yes. Uh, and, and I said I might have chosen uh, others. There are very many bands where, which uh, I like. Uh, I might have uh, uh, ch chosen uh, the Slits. I might, uh, I might have uh, chosen. Uh, the penetration, um, yeah, I, I might have chosen uh, others, yes. yes. I might have chosen Poison Girls and Crass. Our, our first gig as Cheap and Nasty was with Crass and Poison Girls and in Voorschot and we organized it. When right. were, it was the only tour of the European continent of Crass. So, were you linked uh, through, how were you linked with Crass? Because Crass was pretty much, was a big political band at the time. Yes. Were you linked politically with them on, the, you know, on that? Or, or is it at that stage that you decided to uh, create or to, to yeah, to, to develop the rock, um, rock Against Racism movement in the Netherlands? Well, uh, I uh, interviewed Crass when I was the first time in London in 1978, when they were not yet very well uh, known uh, then. But uh, already in the spring 78, I had, in the first issue of PIN, I have written about rock against racism in Britain. And I wrote that it's time that it should also be rock against racism in the, in the Netherlands, because there was a fascist uh, party, Nederlandse Volksunie, uh, which... Uh, I think which, uh, yeah, yes. was mentioning it earlier on, yes. Yes, uh, and uh, I, uh, I already, uh, well, be even before punk uh, started, I, cons saw, I considered myself sort of uh, an anarchist, uh, really, so it really... Uh, when I met Chris, there were fair, for overlapping uh, viewpoints, uh, indeed, yes. Right. And um, so maybe would you like to talk to us a little bit about Cheap and Nasty before we move on to the project, Punk Studies pro project? Yes. Uh, well, uh, we, uh, uh, we started, um, uh, Terry and me started Cheap and Nasty in Paradiso in Amsterdam in 79 at a gig by, by the Ruts. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, we, uh, we very quickly found a, a guitarist and a drummer. And Ma Martin was really a, a good drummer, but, uh, but the problem was a bit, he was at secondary school and sometimes he could not play and then uh, in that case uh, there was a girl called Maria who lived close to me and uh, then uh, she played uh, drums. She la later when we made our EP she played on one of the songs we played uh, the, in the studio. It was also her drum kit on, on which uh, we play, played and well uh, we had our first guitarist but uh, Terry uh, kicked uh, him out because uh, he was uh, he could not follow the speed of Terry's bass line. Terry had been playing acoustic guitar since he was 13 years old, and Terry has a uh, uh, bit unusual long fingers, which make it uh, easier to uh, to uh, play with, with, with strings. Uh, so uh, it's uh, she has the same birthday as Chrissy Hind, by the way. And Chrissy Hind also has unusually long fa fingers. Uh, so uh, I don't think it is it has anything really to do with birthday. Uh, they say, I think it is really a coincidence. But uh, anyway, 
then uh, our first uh, guitarist uh, was uh, was uh, gone and and uh, and one time we uh, we had plans to play in england in the summer of 1980 and we invited uh, pebbles to come with us and, and at the time we thought she is uh, uh, she is still in a band in Amsterdam. We don't want to poach her, but she can be guest uh, guitarist for but well. But then the mishap happened with the uh, key uh, of our rehearsal space in a squad. The key wasn't uh, there, and uh, and Pebbles and Terry had to rehearse acoustically with their bass guitar and uh, their electric guitar, and there they are both. Uh, there were both girls, uh, uh, big, uh, taller than average. Uh, so, and Terry had a very small car, but uh, they still managed uh, somehow. But then uh, we heard that the planned concerts uh, in, in England uh, could not go ahead. So, well, Terry and me went uh, anyway, but we didn't invite Pebbles. Well, if I would have known at that point that. Uh, that uh, Pebbles was not in a band anymore, then I would ha have asked her, uh, please become our uh, gu uh, guitarist. But uh, well, I didn't uh, know. I thought, well, she will want to go back to her uh, Amsterdam uh, band. And okay, and then we got a second guitarist uh, uh, called Andy for, from The Hague, but he also. He was not uh, as good uh, as at playing guitar as, as uh, Terry was uh, at playing bass. So he also, so then he, uh, Terry dismissed him uh, as well. And our third guitarist, Case, was a really a good guitarist, as, as good on guitar as Terry was uh, on, on bass. And uh, well, and then uh, we, uh, when Terry and me were in, uh, in London, uh, we got invited to the place of, of Crass Dial House, and there we met a, a band called uh, Zones. Uh, I, I, I don't know if the pronunciation is right. Uh, at, at first, they, uh, they, uh, they themselves pronounced, pronounced it as Zones, but it, it, it seems to be Zones. Yes. Yes. Uh, and they, they said, well, we have just our EP out, and we want to play a, a tour. And, Europe, can you help us? Uh, and uh, I said, uh, so said well, yes, uh, we can help you. And then Steve Lake, the singer of, of, of Thunes, uh, came to stay for a few days at my at my place, and uh, and to get we found also a sort of uh, venues, and uh, and uh, we managed to get a, a sixty day tour of the Netherlands, of Berlin, and of of Belgium and it went uh, well uh, when we played the Melkweg venue in Amsterdam. Terry uh, had uh, her, uh, uh, had written a song on bass uh, uh, called Cover Girl and uh, the others had not heard it yet and she played it on bass uh, at Soundcheck at the Melkweg and everyone uh, Ria, Maria, the, the drummer, Martin, the other drummer, uh, Case, the guitarist, and me immediately picked up the song and we played it uh, during our, our set uh, in the Melkweg and also as an encore. So, uh, right. Uh, we'll listen to the full uh, EP uh, from Cheap and Nasty in your playlist, I think. Um, so, uh, so, and you were on, you're on vocal at that stage. You're on vocal and cheap and nasty. Yes, I vocal and also toy saxophone. You can hear a bit of toy saxophone on the title track on the cover girl. Yes, the, the second part. Yes. Yes, and your playlist. And we'll talk about your playlist. Is is quite different from the other two girls because you're you've actually focused, I think, on uh, Dutch bands. Uh, yes, exclusively, which is really also um, interesting for us because we never have an opportunity to hear um, Dutch bands, I think, uh, of that period anyway. Uh, but to go back now to, um, uh, you seem to be very interested in, uh, you know, from what I hear from you there, 
I can see why recollection and remembrance is so uh, an important factor in your project. So now I think it's time for you to introduce your project of, you know, which is framed through something called the Punk Scholar Network and Punk Studies. So maybe introduce what, you know, what this project is and what you're trying to achieve in, the, in doing this. We are, our plan is to interview 29 uh, uh, punk women of the period 1976, really the beginning until 1982. And we chose the number 29 because there is only one book really about punk uh, in this period in the Netherlands. And they interviewed 29 men and only one woman, which means 3%. And there were at least 200 207, uh, and yesterday I, I, I discovered uh, woman uh, number 208 uh, who was in a Rotterdam uh, band, which I had not known about yet, and uh, I got it. So really, uh, there were so many women, and and why is it that uh, uh, there was a very real presence of, of women in the early Dutch punk, and why does the literature about it uh, writes so few about it, and then you can uh, uh, the the reason the art uh, Paul Kabakos is a uh, professor of uh, or, or of uh, popular music studies in, uh, in in Rotterdam, and he wrote an MA thesis about early Dutch punk women. Uh, it was two hundred pages, but it was never published. Were well, only 18 pages in a magazine uh, article uh, was pu uh, published. So there's really uh, very, uh, very little published about uh, women in early Dutch uh, punk. And we sh should uh, not wait until uh, women uh, die or maybe have uh, for for forgotten uh, things. We should. Uh, do something now to pre preserve that memories because also uh, uh, Pauline Murray, uh, I heard Pauline Murray of penetration last year. There was a forum on the women in punk at the Rebellion Festival in Blackpool and she said before uh, punk started, uh, women could basically uh, all, only be uh, a groupie or a background singer or a non-threatening vocalist uh, li like uh, Kiki D and uh, uh, and uh, a vocalist uh, like Susie was uh, very different from the usual type in the in music uh, before punk uh, started. Yes. Yes. So and and what? Um, yes. Yeah, so is it? Purely because you felt that, you know, there was something, there was some kind of cultural heritage that was dying or maybe was threatened by, you know, the passage of time that made you, because I mean, you seem to have been interested in, in uh, women's punk, punk bands from the get go anyway. Yes, I saw. I, I saw that the time that one of the good things about the punk was that, that it was uh, no longer the situation. Uh, my impression about the music scene before punk started was really: uh, you have to be uh, uh, rich. You have to have been at music school for at least. Uh, for, for four years, and uh, all, all the band members have to be male and well, and I did not f fit in with these uh, uh, categories. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, oh yes, and you have to be uh, at least over thirty years old uh, was basically the impression, and I did not fit in uh, these uh, categories except being male, but uh, but. Uh, I was unemployed, and I thought uh, it has uh, it, uh, the the music scene, uh, the, the music which was played on the radio had nothing to do to to do with me uh, really. And one of the good things is that now uh, 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 women uh, are also 
joining in bands uh, as singers, as bass players, as drummers, uh, as guitarists, as saxophone players uh, sometimes. As yeah, people. variety, a variety of instruments. Yes, really. Uh, there are uh, often the Dutch uh, punk uh, early punk women. Uh, about one third were vocalists, and two thirds were various types of, of instruments. Uh, uh, most uh, guitarists and bass, but also quite some uh, drummers and uh, some uh, saxophone players and some keyboard players. There was one flute player in the band, the Wandas, and you can uh, hear it uh, in the, the Wandas were an all women band for, from Alkmaar and they were special. They had the flute player and you can hear the flute in the, their song. And, um, do you, I mean, you know, you, you have like, you, you've obviously, um, produced some numbers about the, about this study, but how do you go about approaching women who are in punk bands or, or I think what you're also mentioning women who are in the punk movement who were non musicians? And from my experience, I knew quite a lot of women who were involved in writing about punk bands and interviewing punk bands rather than playing music. Um, so my, my question is there, you know, maybe you want to, you know, is your study just focused on uh, women who were in, in bands and how did you find them? How do you approach them? What's your, what's your methodology to go about your project? Well, I, uh, if you look uh, through uh, fanzines, you discover a lot, and and uh, I knew uh, a lot of the the, uh, the uh, these women. I knew them personally from when I was a band. Uh, we played uh, together with the Wandas, for for for, for instance, uh, and I knew the 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 Loos, uh, very well because their rhythm guitars became our saxophone uh, player and uh, and uh, Saskia when we recorded our uh, our EP uh, she was, was uh, she put uh, the drum kit together in the in the studio so so uh, I I really know uh, scores of, of women for personally from the, the, that time and and also in fanzines you can and then you find uh, there were at least uh, 208 women in bands and also women who were uh, doing other things like like fanzines or uh, uh, there were uh, sometimes uh, women that were both in bands and uh, for instance, Terry in our band, uh, she uh, she also wrote in 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 pin and made photos uh, for pin and f uh, in cheap and nasty. The whole infrastructure of people around the band were women. We had a girl who was our photographer, a girl who who was our our driver, and uh, the the road crew were two girls who were 15 years old um, at our first gig with Crescent and boys and girls, they said, we want to go with you to your other gigs in other places. And the, I said, well, then you have to become our, our road crew. And, 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 and they did, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I still uh, know them uh, well. They still live uh, not far away from me, yes. And um, I, I also think you you talk about forgetfulness as far as um, I'd like you to talk about forgetfulness about the punk movement and women as well in terms of recording history. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I know, you know, you, you know, I don't know if it, you would call it discrimination, but, you know, forgetfulness as far as the women bands are and p possibly the punk movement as well. Well, I, I think uh, well, there are several p p points uh, about it. Uh, uh, you might uh, have the hypothesis that uh, that uh, that uh, 
so few is uh, written about uh, women uh, because the fanzines uh, 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 during that er early period didn't write uh, much about them. But that is not true. When you read these fanzines, you can read about the women who were members uh, of the various uh, bands. So it must be something uh, else. And, uh, and there are various uh, series uh, Anita Ragunat, uh, for instance, uh, and Kirsty Lohmann ha have written uh, in punk and post-punk that they are two factors. They think uh, the, that uh, there was a, that many bands, uh, prominent bands, uh, signed uh, re record uh, contracts and uh, the record companies favored uh, all male bands. That that was uh, that was a reason because uh, later writings about uh, punk neglected uh, women. That that was one uh, point and uh, and uh, and other point which they say and uh, I don't know to which extent it is true. The, about 1982, there was the rise within punk of what was was then called hardcore punk, and uh, and they say that that uh, really pushed uh, women aside a bit. That is also the idea of of Susie uh, has said. Uh, uh, she said that it become very, very male. I don't say it, it fits in all, uh, because the, there was then, uh, also in the Netherlands, uh, uh, later, post-1982, there was a band uh, called Nogwat, which, which were all women and was so-called hardcore punk. And, uh, and uh, today in Belgium, there is a band called Hetzen, which are three women and one man, and it's also uh, hardcore punk, but it, it may be one of the points. And, and uh, you know, in England, uh, in the UK, there was also the point that uh, th there was neglect of uh, the role of women in punk in academic uh, writings. Helen um, McCallum, uh, uh, aka Helen Reddington, aka H H Helen McCookery book, uh, said when she uh, 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 came uh, in, uh, into an, a university. She saw academic books on punks and he said, hooray, now I'm going to read about Susie and about the slits and about uh, the raincoats and about penetration, etc. But the books were mostly about all male bands. And then she said, mm -hmm. well, we, I should do something about that. And she wrote uh, books and she made a film as well, as well together with Gina Birch. Uh, and there is also uh, Cilla Minx at the moment, the, the singer of Rubella Ballet, who, who is making a, a, a movie called uh, She Rocks uh, Punk uh, and uh, about women worldwide. She also uh, she includes uh, she it uh, she includes in it uh, uh, interviews with women from the Netherlands, uh, in, including Terry of uh, Tipanasti and the poetess Diana Ozon, who was also the editor of the Koekrant, which was uh, really the fir first Amsterdam punk fanzine in 1977. Right. Um, so maybe you'd, you'd, you'd send me the references, you know, those references that you just talked about so that I can include them uh, to the notes uh, with the radio show. Um, yes. You know, th those films. Um, I think we're going to uh, move on to Aurelia and how she's linked, you know, how she ties in with your research. But before uh, that, maybe would you like to tell us what happened to the Loos? Um, I know they're going to be in the second edition of, of Punks Listen, but um, what's happened to the Loos? And talk to us about your, because I know they're on your playlist. Talk to us about the songs that you've picked for your playlist. Yeah, the 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 first so, song uh, back on the street uh, is a uh, was written uh, at least co-written by by Saskia the young the, the drummer and is really about not fitting in uh, and well uh, and I could relate very easily 
to it for instance i had not fitted in at secondary school but it was a very elite uh, uh, secondary school i was the only non-elite kid there and they considered me, other pupils considered me a sort of intruder from a neighborhood where not everyone were, was rich uh, so uh, and, uh, and so uh, I could e e easily relate to the loose song uh, back uh, on the street uh, and the other song uh, uh, was recorded in 1979 in Paris when really the, the loose were on, on the point of uh, splitting really uh, they split in two parts uh, Raphael, the, the rhythm guitarist, and Saskia, the drummer, they went to, to, uh, to England, and they were, and they joined band in England, and they played for Rock Against Racism in, in England, while the other two, uh, uh, Tolim Toto and Pamela Popo, they stayed in France, and they worked on a film uh, uh, there, uh, and, uh, they lost touch a bit, and then uh, after uh, England, uh, Saskia decided to go back to Leiden, where she was born, and uh, I met her there, and a bit later when I visited Saskia, there was uh, another person, there was uh, Raphael, who also had come, for, come and, uh, and Raphael said, I play saxophone, and, uh, and I said, well, uh, I'm a big... Uh, X Apex uh, fan, uh, can you play saxophone in uh, in our uh, in Chipenasti? And she said uh, yes. And uh, it was a bit unfortunate. Uh, we had the plan to, to play in uh, England, and we did play in England, but we had to go in Terry's small car, and uh, 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 where only four people fitted in, uh, plus Terry's bass and plus. Uh, the, the the guitars and uh, so Raphael could not join us in playing in Ipswich in Eng England. Then she played with us the first time in Paradiso when the, uh, we played there in August 1981, and it was uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it was really. Uh, we were headline band in the big hall of Paradiso, and Paradiso uh, said, "You can br bring uh, you your own uh, support band." And we chose the Miami Beach Girls, which was the band uh, of Saskia. She had uh, uh, f formed the band with ten, uh, four other girls, and uh, and they often played with us also then in Paradiso. Right. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll ask uh, Aurelia to join in now and uh, to...
through the windows, sleeping in my bed. Stumbling through the walls, with my shirts to sores. Screaming for my calls, the rats make me scream at my rats, make me faint at sight rats. Crawling up my legs, stumbling through the windows, sleeping in my bed. Stumbling through the walls, with my shirts to sores. Screaming for my calls, the rats make me scream at my rats, make me faint at sight rats.
Okay, um, so maybe we'll ask uh, Aurelia to join in now and uh, to, you know, to see, uh, maybe to explain to us uh, how you got in touch or how you two uh, got in touch and, um, and you know, how you came on board or, you know, what's your situation in relation to this project, Aurelia? Uh, this kind of happened pretty much, well, unintentionally, and that sounds it's a bit of backstory to it. Um, well, back in the 90s, uh, when I was still living in Lithuania, I was 15 around that time, and uh, uh, I was editing the somewhat more intersectional fanzine with another girl. Uh, our fanzine was called Joades Kroes, and uh, uh yeah uh, we, we did uh, some punk stuff we did uh, some metal stuff some arty stuff fiction there, there was everything in it sort of mixed uh, including some feminists which uh, uh guys really uh, kind of got a bit of a shock uh, because it uh, wasn't something that was talked about at that time so from that time i had uh, a lot of friends still um and when uh, I moved eventually to the Netherlands about 20 years back, uh, when I go back, I still keep in touch with the guys in the scene and uh, with the beer. I was usually whining to some of my former uh, fans in uh, editor friends that, well, we should do something about it. So at some point, uh, Ugnus, uh, as well, he was editor from Witches and the Beer, fans and uh, he kind of put uh, together a group uh, of other fans and editors that well here yeah, talk to those people stop uh, nagging on me about it so we kind of talked about it but uh, everybody has uh, well their, their own life uh, and uh, nothing happened and then in 2019 just before the all a corona breakout, I got mail from my former colleague in the university in Lithuania. You know, uh, she says, uh, we wrote a project to digitize uh, the fans. So, 
deadline is uh, in a week. Uh, can you look at it? So uh, I fixed a bit that whole proposal and just, I think, because uh, uh, lockdowns happened, we probably, because of that reason, we got the funding because, well, that's something you can do in the lockdown situation. So for the history of our fences, the epidemic kind of uh, went uh, quite beneficial. So, uh, so we started with that collecting the defenses, and of course, we had a lot of punk stuff. And I was looking at it, and I don't remember anything. So I started well looking a bit of the context because well, you have to understand the jokes, and well, it was a while ago, so uh, and. Uh, and I started to look for the information. I was like, now in the Netherlands, there should be plenty of done. It's a Western country. Uh, well, we always expect that when we are in the EU. Mm. So that's how I came across uh, the um, uh, advertisement of Women in Punk Conference that uh, Herman and the rest of, of, of our club uh, uh, were organizing. So I wrote to them, uh, more or less, now help me, maybe you can suggest something. And that's how we came in touch. And then it turns out in the Netherlands, there actually isn't that a lot of done with, with that whole heritage because it's not systematically con collected. There isn't actually a proper archive of uh, fanzines or any other memorabilia. And uh, it's a huge problem in a way because, uh, yeah, um, to collect it and to store it, it's a lot of things involved in that. But when you try to do it, you very quickly run into the institutional walls in that sense that uh, in the universities, they kind of don't want to do it because for them, the only production that's important is the scientific articles. And they are kind of not really interested in keeping just their life. And to do it outside of that as well is difficult because you have to find the financing and you have to, well, store it in some kind of at least semi-professional uh, situation because it's uh, fragile paper or, or well, uh, yes. uh, tapes or if you want to digitize it to make it more accessible you have to have server capacity i don't know how many hard drives i bought by now just to store the data the data gas so 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 there are a lot of those things and um, when you look from the um, as well, academic perspective, you very quickly run into those theoretical frameworks, like you have to write about feminism or women and feminism or this or that. But that actually kind of sucks out the essence of what it was back, because a lot of that was actually fun. Yeah. And academic kind of does not talk about fun. So, so that's why I think what we are now trying to do is a nice way to do it in that sense that you don't write something uh, about women, but well, you just do the interview and you put it there. And it is how it is. It, it's not uh, somebody's chewed up opinion about what women uh, were doing in, in punk. It's just, uh, well, the story and i think those stories are kind of important in in the whole remembering about the scene about the culture that uh, it's not just somebody's uh, retold the kind of thing so that's the reason why you're you're choosing the interview uh, medium to record um this cultural heritage yeah, in, in a sense, I think that that's, well, um, uh, I mean, okay, as an anthropologist, I could write something, uh, article, I, I could do those interviews, write an article in scientific press, which nobody will read, uh, and that is kind of pointless. In, in that sense, uh, yeah, if you gather the interviews with people speaking about themselves at that and then publish that, it's at least the, that living culture as it is and not uh, my perspective on that uh, 
culture that's uh, why I'm uh, really uh, glad to, to join this project with Herman because well interviews is something that I do for a living uh, in that anthropological right. sense so and it's quite interesting because you know um, as you say with you know the studies which are being developed in into uh, the condition of women and feminism it seems to be to me that it should be a kind of a, a topic of choice. Like you come up with a new aspect, a new prism to uh, to talk about feminism. Why is there? Do you think is there, are there obstacles to um, to uh, to gathering this, these documents in terms of academia? You know what what's you know why is there a re, you know you, you seem to say this kind of a, a re reluctance talk you know looking into this topic why do you think that is well it, it's actually practical because if you want to have funding for that sort of study you have to apply to either foundation either government and that usually is the frame framework uh, that you have to do something uh, uh, well uh, talk how uh, feminism or advanced women were or, or so, but that as well is a bit, uh, uh, we, we have that saying that uh, who pays for the music chooses the tune. And that you very quickly fall into that, that uh, you have to write about things, uh, only those things that uh, are in the scope of the study and you have to throw out the rest. Uh, which isn't, I think, the, the, the best uh, way at least to do um, the well scene of subculture study because uh, there is a lot of things that, that play because when you talk about well feminism or women and punk, what often is really forgotten that they were mainstream and the mainstream girls. And often as a girl, you had more issues with the other girls that were in the normal girls then you actually had uh, with the guys in the scene. I mean, there always were a few idiots, but uh, or, or somebody that, that would uh, kind of be over sexual or so, but that wasn't actually the norm. You usually felt quite safe with the guys, but the other girls that were at school or around you could be really mean about it. And I think for the girls, that kind of matters more uh, in, in that sense that you, well, uh, are quite connected. You, you look for that social contact and those girl and girl dynamics, generally, they are not that uh, popular in the gender studies because uh, they kind <laughs> of uh, sometimes bring you to the wrong conclusion. So, yeah, it's a bit uh, that... Uh, so, I mean, our listeners don't know about this, but you're quite a bit younger than, than us. So you're coming to this with a different eye, uh, with quite a big, you know, almost certainly for me, two decades. Uh, you know, you're young, you're yeah. 20 years younger. So do you feel that the fact that, you know, from, from a research perspective, because I, I find it amazing that, uh, basically you said, Okay, you came across a phenomenon that basically there's no, you know, that said nothing to you. So, you know, we've been spending our time here and we're always talking about the great days of punk and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, when you try to research it, you 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 find very little about this. Um, it, it's or you're having problems uh you know get, you know getting information together and you know isn't that a bit strange because you know i think if people look look from my generation going into rock and roll or blues um i think we certainly feel that there's ample you know recordings and you know we seem to have been able to keep the to keep the the past but I think you're referring to a special kind of, you know, you're saying there's the fun, the fun element that is missing out of. How do you find that from what you see, from what you find? I think that's just well talking to people, really, because it's not, it's quite those elusive things that 
actually well they 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 made that sphere that uh, because i think well it's different generation but things kind of were the same it, it's that uh, feeling that you are not really a part of the mainstream culture that uh, you want to change things you uh, do not feel like you belong in, in in that normal culture and and i think that that lasted really for for a long time i'm not sure if that's still the case uh, for the current generation that's growing up but yeah. certainly was for mine so yes. yeah so 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 that's uh, but I think that's that that you communicate more through stories rather than the studies, and in that sense, that well, those small things that people tell about some stupid thing that happened in the concert or just some stupid shit you got into because uh, well, uh, it, it happened. It, it's what really makes it uh, so much fun. Yes. Because, well, uh, you were talking, for example, about um, uh, those record uh, stores and what big uh, influence it, it had on, on you. And I remember reading um, a similar thing about guys in Latvia that uh, they used to go. So when the last uh, trolleybus stop uh, in Riga in um, the forest to exchange the tapes that they wrote uh, well would bring the empty tape to the guy who had uh, the records and the next weekend they will go there in the forest to collect the uh, well uh, rewritten uh, cassette with, with with that record because that's the only way how you could get uh, hand on on those things and uh, it, it trained that things were quite uh, quite different and all the letters that uh, you wrote to each other and uh, those yeah. things and uh, yeah the, the, that's what made it uh, so special but i think as well with um, women culture as well that uh, there was our own kind of as well i would not say maybe discourse but we, we were talking differently with the other girls than we were talking with the guys we had the, our own agenda and sometimes i'm reading all those studies uh, like all oh, that just women were only girlfriends or or well um then mothers or whatever and i'm like now it's good that we never really had uh, known about that because it's not how that was or how we saw yeah. it i mean guys might have saw it that way but definitely not us yeah no i think you're right to point out that uh, there's a discrepancy between the way uh somebody has lived something and uh, recounts a story and the way it's perceived by the person who's listening. So, for example, I think the fashion thing, when I talk to my kids about punk, they think uh, you were just following a fashion. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. No. And it's very difficult to to relay this, uh, the feeling of, you know, you, you felt you were you were different. You felt you weren't uh, you weren't the same as a you know like things. I remember wearing, I mean I don't know pebbles about you, but I remember wearing lipstick on as as um, eyeshadow, <laughs> you know, uh, that kind of stuff. And I think if you know, yeah, we uh, put lipstick in our hair. Uh, oh yes, a uh, food. Yeah. You know, uh, well, we I had food coloring in my hair at one stage. We couldn't we couldn't afford the the dye. <laughs> Uh, you you can imagine, uh, no, <laughs> not very permanent, but yeah, there's all sorts of things that, you know, they look like, I, and I'm particularly interested with the fashion as well. I don't know if you have an opinion on that, because, you know, um, women were kind of making us a, a statement by, you know, wearing things like, um, what are they called? The tights, fishnet tights. Yeah. And, you know, maybe um, you'd be wearing um, fluorescent socks with them, with pointy heels, stilettos and that thing. And from from now, it looks like, well, you were just obeying, you know, uh, you, you were just, you know, playing with, you know, um, diktats of, of female fashion. But of course, it didn't feel like this at all. Uh, you know, I felt I was being very, very original with that. 
So I, I don't know about if you share that, um, if you get that kind of sense when you're interviewing the women that I think that's what you're pointing out. Yeah, 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 that's as well. Uh, I have still my all the letters from back uh, back in the scene time. So I have uh, the, the correspondence with the girls is quite different because I was reading through some of, of the letter that one of my female friends wrote me and it's like uh, starts with all the high philosophy and politics and whatever and then the next paragraph is and you know I found that skirt somewhere in my grandmother's uh, wardrobe and it really looks good and it is so that that's a girl thing and and I don't think the guys were, were like that and we were really switching that from the curly things that's because you still wanted to look well not maybe beautiful but you wanted to make well the statement with with your look and beautiful is kind of not your thing because uh, I, I of course grew up in all that uh, high fashion model era which had very high standards what was beautiful and you had to starve yourself and, and that sort of stuff which we were not into that but um, you still wanted to look the certain way and you had to figure how you're going to do it because there were no shops or pre-made things or order something online. You have to kind of uh, find something in your uh, grandma's wardrobe or, or make it yourself. I remember yes. we made uh, t-shirts with the oil paint because that you can actually wash uh, ourselves because, well, we could not really uh, have the band t-shirt or whatever the other way. So. Yeah, I mean, I remember doing stencil you yeah. stenciling my clothes, uh, you know, but anyway, so uh, would you say, um, yeah, I think Pebbles told us that uh, the punk movement really helped her, you know, express her sense of rebellion. Do you think it's something that you find systematically or it, are there other other elements that you find when you when you're interviewing the the women of that time? Yeah, I, I think that, that there is uh, rebellion and I think, uh, well, uh, with, with those uh, generations before mine, that, that of course we already built on, on the things that have been achieved. Because uh, when I came in the 90s, uh, I never really had that idea that uh, I'm unequal in any way to the guys. Well, maybe I should have felt that way, but uh, I did not think of it so so, so that well in, 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 when you are 15 you, you think of it differently of course but um, yeah the i i think uh, well what is as well important is that uh, thread that goes through the different generations of well punk in this case but in the subculture in general that um, uh, the, the the women's story, the the the, well, the looks, uh, the how we felt in 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 that culture, what we try to achieve in in that culture, and, and I think that's important and often uh, forgotten aspect of it because we as well were there, and I think as well that women often generally choose those support ro roles more than those in, in the front. Uh, maybe in, in the early punk generation, maybe that's a, a bit was different, but even in those um, hardcore punk and, and the later generations, there, there were women still in the crowd, which maybe did not climb on the stage, but they, they were the part of it. You cannot exclude that part from the movement because then the history is incomplete. And I would hate to think that when uh, current generation girls read about uh, punk back in the days, there isn't anything uh, said about the women. and. That you feel, I think, in the current generation more in the way that they really look for those female role models and uh, females in history rather than, well, trying to follow how the guys did it. And I think those conversations are important that when you talk about how a high philosophy and then the skirts, because that's how we do it. And uh, 
uh, how to be uh, as well, uh, how you grow up in that uh, sense that what it is to be an older person in the subculture, as we often talk about punk as the youth culture, but uh, none of us are actually young anymore and how that plays as well, what happens after the 20s, that, that as well is something that's really interesting to me that uh, it does not end when you grow up and go live the normal life. Well, I mean, I'm running on my Sundays doing the punk interviews, so that as well is uh, something. And uh, tell me, before we uh, we finish up with the playlist, maybe Aurelia, uh, would you maybe talk to us whether, because you're a little bit younger than us, um, did you discover bands? Is there are there bands that you you know? Is is your did your research lead uh, to you uh, really liking um, new bands? Do you discover? Did you discover new bands when you do, or do, are you still discovering new bands when you're doing your research? And I was going to add to you that you know this thing, uh, the French um, research, and you know the the CNRS, they're actually very concerned about the the. There's a whole team. I will send you the YouTube video, the YouTube link, if you're interested. Um, there's a whole segment of this. I think I, I have their name here. Um, academics, one, two, three, four people who have found a, a kind of sub team to to go and get posters, cassettes, you know, uh, also all these things um, that, you know, concert tickets, all these things that um, are you know they they can easily disappear this is the the medium can easily disappear but that's being done in french as well and it's being subsidized by the um cnrs uh, centre national de recherche et de sciences so um you might be interested in that as well um no, but it, it is uh you know you have to go and talk to people and you have to go and you know ask them to look into their wardrobes and so on and so forth um i mean by chance i did i did something like this um a few years ago i looked through because now the concert tickets i don't know if you you guys remember the days when the concert tickets were absolutely uh, wonderful to look at they all look the same now, uh, but you know I have my collection of you know old uh, old concert tickets that I went to, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, but yes, yeah, so go back to you know, are there bands that you discovered that you uh, kind of really got into with your research? If there are that uh, I I think it's uh, those two ways. One is that sometimes I discover something that I haven't heard before, but. As well, I listen to some things that I might have listened at before, but back then it kind of did not stick. And now when I'm older, the, the uh, case, for example, with Joy Division, I listen to it. Oh, that's actually quite good because in the teens, I think uh, I, I went for a bit more fast music and, and a bit of more aggressive because back then I think uh, Rage Against the Machine and Killing in the Name of would have been my uh, most uh, favorite song. And now I listen to it and it sounds a little bit flat. Uh, musically, and uh, I still love that song, but it's not something that I listen a lot anymore to. So it is, uh, well, uh, things and, and the cramps, for example, as well, that are in the playlist uh, that just uh, came up uh, as well, going through the music and uh, trying to remember what actually punk was about, uh, or, or and the Stranglers uh, as well. Um, no more heroes. Uh, it was surprising <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that was the song that actually started uh, more or, or had more influence on the early punk movement in Lithuania rather than Sex Pistols, which often are associated uh, with punk. But that uh, actually was more important for, for the early generation than uh, well, something that's um, so well known. So, so that things and uh, yeah, the code blue as well. Uh, 
something that uh, a friend suggested that I uh, haven't heard before, so it was quite uh, funny in a way, and uh, due to it being quite daring, and uh, yeah, it, it's as well that my daughter, for example, discovers a lot of that stuff through TikTok as uh, their background music, so for them it's a bit, uh, their time MTV in a way, just a bit uh, less... Uh, guided maybe so but well uh, as, as i said before that when i was making uh, my playlist suggestions i looked at it and um i was like what should i do then i thought um, i should maybe add something what my daughter is listening and then i looked at her playlist and no radio is not going to dare to broadcast that because it's so obscene and uh, uh, the the things that I'm like now uh, and often she, when she sends me something now listen to that but you know that might be a bit too heavy uh, language for for you See, like your daughter yeah. is a punk you don't from what I gather your daughter your daughter is a punk yeah something uh, in that direction she also listens to a lot of different stuff as well hip hop and 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 that sort of stuff but but there is something and it's so funny to to be on that other uh, other side of the mirror in a way that uh, you're now that parent that really does not understand and uh, things are too obscene for you that sort of stuff Right, well, I think we're coming to the end of our time together here, but I was wondering, is there is there anything else you would like, you know, that maybe I didn't think of asking you that, that maybe um, you'd like to talk about? Maybe I would uh, like to uh, say one sentence I heard uh, last year for, from Don Letts, who was the DJ at the first uh, London punk club, uh, the, the Roxy. Uh, he said last year at Rebellion, punk is mainly not something to look back uh, to, but, but to look forward uh, ah. to, to. And I am a historian, and so I tend to look back a, a bit, but I should should also remember that I also should uh, look forward and uh, I listen uh, a lot also to punk bands who were only founded uh, recently. Yes, and I think you have plans for many other interviews with your with your yes. study as well. Yes. So, yeah, so uh, I'd like to thank you all and uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, thank you so much for taking the time and sending me all these documents. I really, really appreciate it. And I think our listeners, we will really, uh, enjoy listening to your interviews, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Th thanks for having us. Bye. 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 -bye. <laughs>what an incredible show for blitzkrieg pop number 33 and uh, yes. and here's uh danielle to tell you about it thanks yeah. so much yeah so i really want to thank all our guests and you know pebbles for telling us all about her adventures as a, a young teenager in the world of punk music i mean she was you know she i was just reminded that she was a kind of kind of a little bit younger mm -hmm. uh, two three years younger than me which made her really young. 14, 15 is really young mm -hmm. when you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, thank, uh, thanking Herman for organizing the Punk Studies event for people to listen on from, from that platform as well. And Herman, as you have discovered, has all the facts mm -hmm. and he is here to remind us to remember he is um he seems to have quite a good memory himself and then um i was interested to speak with aurelia because she's not a musician and she's not really looking i mean she likes music she's a music lover obviously but she has a kind of a scientific approach to her which i thought was very interesting and it's something that i think i mentioned in the interview we are you know, encountering more and more people who treat the punk movement, punk music as mm -hmm. something serious to look at. Um, 
And then, of course, they provided us um, with all, you know, three very, very different um, playlists. Um, and I was really, you know, Herman's list was, it, to me, was the most, you know, in a way, uh, the most um, surprising because mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know about you, but I certainly had never heard of all the bands that he um, he included on his playlist. And then we had a classic uh, women punk band uh, playlist from Pebbles, and from Aurelia, who's a little bit uh, younger, she gave us a number of you know big guns as well as more modern more modern kind of uh, mm -hmm. big guns as well so they were all quite different um, and you know you know really interesting to explore what other people from other countries listen to as well and what's in common with uh, you know between all of us and uh, what's different uh, mm -hmm. between all of us as well um, but I really like this um, you know this spirit that you know we, we must look we we must preserve our heritage and you know uh, take care of it i really think that that's the point of everything we do on this radio and on this show as well mm -hmm. um you know so that was uh, a different uh, interview yeah it was incredible um it was great to have those three different um perspectives on um you know on a common topic even though you know the topic itself sometimes changed in terms of you know but i love that when it uh the perspective can switch to the documentation um itself um i love that <laughs> it's very cool um but the pebbles pebbles interview was great you know just hear her talk about you know, carrying a guitar around in a bag you know i've definitely i've definitely been there as well but um but yeah just from the perspective that i was such a young person um at a you know at such a critical time for music and such a historic era such a unique perspective and great to hear uh the bands in the uh, second set and uh, and, and to hear her heroes as well is really great and i had a, a lot musically in common with uh, her pick yeah. in that first one is pretty great yeah um and i think we're going to get much more documents from herman uh, but mm -hmm. you know as you know as you know, Michael Murphy is is, is releasing a second book. Oh, so wow. he could so have great. a show. Um, but he's just told me that he is trying to organize some kind of an uh, an archive for Irish punk bands as well. So I think we're we'll going to be on to that as well. Definitely. Um, I, I absolutely think it's just the right thing to do is document all these things, you know. Mm. I know I remember a few years ago, I think I, I um I took a picture of my old concert tickets and, and, and I just put them up on, online mm -hmm. just because they were so nice, you know, they were, yeah. they, the concert tickets were all different with graphics and that. Mm -hmm. And I really had, you know, when I did this, I didn't really think about what I was doing, that I was actually reminding myself um, mm -hmm. and kind of catalog, you know, making a catalog of these things. And if you think about it, if nobody does that, it really is lost. Mm -hmm. It really would, it can be lost because it's you know paper based and um, that kind you know. So I really think it's important to think about it um, much more than we do mm -hmm. in a way. The, well, I'd love to sit there with that uh, if you have uh, you know the the images of all of those and really just kind of that'd be an interesting um, show in itself just to look through those and uh, make a, a playlist based on those tickets and talk about uh, yeah. those gigs that you yeah. remember. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. well, do you know what I mean? I think this, what, what you do on the radio show and what we try to do is to mm. really, you know, make, you know, just tell people there were these people and there were these people there were these people. Exactly. And, you know, it's much easier to, uh, you know, when it's well documented and it's big bands and, you know, okay, there's loads of documents, but so, I mean, the, the big bands are carried by so many other smaller bands and they are equally important in my mind. Um, so, because they, you know, they give you a picture of the times, not just the big stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so that was today's and I think we'll hear a lot more about Europe. I uh, never expected to find people 
you know, that I did not know and mm. interview them. You know, I was expecting to just interview maybe people I was in touch with previously. Mm. Uh, so it's a new, a new departure for me. Too. No, it went really well. You never, I would never would have. Uh, no, I, I mean, it's cool that you uh, did a few uh, before that. You know, people you were more familiar yes. with it because this one was it sounded, it sounded very smooth to me. Uh, it was no, it was great. But yes, so uh, next time, you know, I was going to do something, and needless to say, I found another idea. Mm. I was listening to Serge Gainsbourg recently, and um, I think I'm going to do for next time in two weeks' time a show about Taxi Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, great! Daniel Park. Um, and the optic would be to see how Serge Gainsbourg, who we talked about in the previous um, episode, in relation to his inspiration being with the uh, you know pre uh, singers, and I think Gainsbourg is a key player in uh, the uh, development of the French touch, and the French touch developed through this kind of new wave. Um, new wave movement that in France that came uh, mm -hmm. right after the punk days. And I think Taxi Girl is the right the right um, lens to look to look to, mm -hmm. to, to what happened to, to the French New Wave mm -hmm. basically and how it turned it into this big thing that is the French touch. And mm -hmm. I think it's it's all Gainsbourg's fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great title <laughs> for the show. <laughs> So that was yes. going to be in uh, two weeks on the 13th? Two weeks time, and then hopefully in two weeks after, we'll have Michael McCartney this time, and we'll talk mm -hmm. about, probably, his, uh, there's so much to talk about, his punk <laughs> and in Cuba, and you know, uh, yeah, so that should be it for the next two sessions. And of course, we have uh, Sunday, yep. um, you know, a punk uh, French woman, <laughs> Jeannette, Jeannette, she's German of Arc herself. Uh, anyway, no, we're doing our film club for people who are not in the know and want to join. It's uh, still the screen, it's at 4 p.m. Um, EST, Eastern Standard Time, and it's at 9 o'clock Irish time, 10 p.m. Uh, continent, uh, European continent, continental time, and we will be discussing a French movie which is a very peculiar kind of a movie because it's um, it's the theme is the the youth of Joan of Arc, um, and it's a it's a kind of an opera, um, and it's played with people who are not really actors, and it's based on a 19th century. Um, it's not based; it's the text is a 19th century uh, text of Charles Piggy. So uh, it, I think the discussion will be. Uh, Challenging and interesting. I don't know. Uh, so uh, cool. this is about what five, six people. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, six or seven. Yeah, yeah but it's it's you know she'll be seen through a punk lens or you know cool. Joan of Arc. Anyway, so we'll talk in two weeks and Sunday before that about cinema this time. So Excellent. thank you for listening and um, yeah. Hey ho, let's go. Goodbye, see you in two weeks. <laughs> All right, another beautiful edition in the books, another important document um, in our uh, catalog of documents. Like you said, you know, like we're always saying, there were these people, but in the future they'll say there were those people who didn't, <laughs> who were talked about those yeah. other people. Yeah, yes. Each, uh, each, little, each little documentary becomes a document, you know, of its own existence. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. Cool. So we'll see you on Sunday, and we'll see you in two weeks for another amazing Blitz Street yeah, Pop. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Yep. Bye. Thanks, folks. Bye. Stay tuned.